Stand, if you will, to Psalm 106. Psalm 106. Enjoy hearing guys sing. In our culture, it seems like guys don't want to sing, but it is a pleasure to hear masculine voices, I can tell you. Thank you for that, guys. Both specials. Thank you for that. Psalm 106, beginning in verse 9. Psalm 106, verse number 9. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths, as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies, There was not one of them left. They believed they his words, and they sang his praise. They soon forgot his works, and they waited not for his counsel, but they waited, excuse me, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Look at verse 15. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for these men that came and sing the specials for us. And Lord, thank you for these that have come today. And Lord, certainly in in our environment, there are so many things, dear dear Jesus, that just seems like it commands our time and our attention. And Father, today when we gather around and we worship and we sing and we fellowship. Father, what a precious time that truly is. And Lord, this is a time that we devote each week. And Father, it's not because of who I am, but Lord, it's just because of who you are. Lord, we're grateful that we can even come into the house of God. Lord, I know that many are uh, sick this morning and uh, many would rather be here than where they at. But God, I pray for the brief moment we have in such a short time. I pray, God, that you'd give us insight. And, Father, I pray that this could be a life-changing message for some. Lord, we've prayed all week for this day. We've we, we done what we needed to do. we visited. We uh, went out in the community. And, Father, we've studied. But, God, now this is your time. This is your moment. And, Lord, I pray if there's any decision that needs to be made today would be it. Lord, we just take this message Take this messenger and place it in thy divine hands. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. A guy by the name of Norman Cousins once said these words, Death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies inside of us while we live. Today we look upon people's faces and you get the idea or the impression that some people in our midst are still living inside, but they died years ago. Things have not worked out well for them. The dreams they've once had are no longer possible. They're simply going through the emotions or the emptiness of all the days. They have nothing to look forward to, nothing they're excited over. And the great life you thought you would have by now has totally disappeared. And therefore, you have never experienced the happiness of joy as those around you. You would readily admit that you're in a rut, and you know it. And because of that, you have a difficult time motivating yourself to be the best you that you can be. So you are simply there to endure even your painful memories and even your past. Admittedly, days are filled with stress and pressure of uh, of our moments, but... You may have many demanding your time and even your resources. You can get through your day with a great deal still left on your plate. And you wonder, is this all of life? I love this quote because I think it speaks to our day and time. Confucius said this, Life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. I like that. But why does it have to be so complicated and Uh, Let's start this morning with this story. One man who had a positive attitude was a man by the name of Truett Cathy. Cathy entered the restaurant business with his brother in 1946. 
the pair bought a small restaurant in Hapesville, Georgia, called the Dwarf House. Kathy had a positive outlook in life, and he was willing to take risk. He was a Sunday school teacher and had a strong belief in Sunday as the day of worship. He believed also that day ought to be devoted to the Lord and to his family. One of Kathy's favorite sayings is, it's easier to build boys and girls than to, me, than to mend men and women. Yeah. Kathy hired a young African-American American named Eddie White in the 1940s. The American South was still segregated at the time, so his decision was viewed widely as unpopular. He would also, he would also go on to mentor a 13-year-old boy named Woody Falk. Woody eventually became his vice president of product development at his restaurants. Woody's uh, fault t- uh, gives a summary of Kathy's character. He said his character could be summed up in James 1, 22, Be you doers of the word. The man by the name of Truett Kathy went on to found the Chick-fil-A restaurants. You see, he lived by that motto, Be you doers of the word. You see, that will have an effect on your attitude and your decision-making process. If that verse can reach a man like Kathy, who will not even open up his businesses on Sunday, it can make a character change in you as well. As you know, we have a Bible full of uh, uh, positive examples, and we also have a Bible full of negative examples to help us in our daily walk. We have uh, people who have modeled Christian behavior and those who have showed us the ugly side of sin right there in our Bibles. But I want to do something for you this morning because I thought this was interesting, especially in our time period in which we live. This message can be broken down into two parts. Because of the psalm, the way that it is written, let me show you this. There are three positive truths, and then I'm going to show you the three negative truths that the psalmist wrote. But because of all of that, it teaches us a great example and teaches us some great lessons in life. And I felt like this is a message that God wanted at this time. So with that in mind, we're going to set out to give you the three positives and the three negatives. And we're going to hopefully help you along the way. The first positive truth that I want to show you is listed in Psalm 106, verse number 9. Psalm 106, verse number 9. The Bible says, He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. Now, follow me with this. It was dried up. And then it goes on. So He led them through the depths and even the wilderness. Now, listen to this. There are three positive truths that, that, that we mention, and I think it's interesting that we not forget these. Now, watch. The first truth I want you to see this morning is a word called piloted. The word piloted, it's on your screen this morning. The first truth is that he piloted them. In Psalm 106, verse number 9, it says, He led them through the depths. The word depths means an abyss, a surging mass of water. Beloved, this was no small feat. When the nation of Israel stepped into the dry riverbed of the Red Sea, it simply had to be overwhelming. But the mighty hand of God was evident and everyone in that dry riverbed benefited from it. Friend, can I tell you this? The Lord skillfully and wonderfully held back the raging currents. I want you to notice something else in Exodus chapter 14, verse number 29. Exodus chapter 14, verse number 29. Kind of a companion verse, if you will. The Bible says it this way. But the children of Israel walked upon the dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that, now watch. And Israel saw that great work, the great work, which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. According to verse 30 of that passage, it said, they saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Frank, can I tell you, tell you this? Like you, there is no doubt that you can point to some examples of how the Lord 
piloted you through some adventures of your life. For instance, maybe the Lord piloted you through some sickness or some surgery or something that you have just recently gone through. And beloved, I can point to many times in my own personal life how if it wasn't, watch this, if it wasn't for the hand of God, we wouldn't be here this morning. Some of you know that. Some of you have experienced it in greater detail than I've had. Some of you have had some uh, adventures or some situations in your life. And you can honestly say this, preacher, if it wasn't for God's hand, there would be no way that I would be here this morning. God just kind of piloted me through those things that I were going through. And can I tell you this? And, and I believe we're on safe ground when we say this. I believe that even God pilots us through even our ignorance. I believe that even God pilots us through, according to Romans, even when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And what, what does that mean? Even when we were rebellious, even when we had no thought of God or did not care about God, He still had His hand upon us and He piloted us because the Bible says this in Isaiah over and over and over. His hand is out, still outstretched. In other words, His hand is outstretched for you today and it's going to be outstretched for you tomorrow providing that you understand this. There is a time when salvation is plentiful. There is a time that you need to take a hold of God's hand, and may I suggest, if you're not walking and talking with Lord as you ought to, then today would be a mighty good day to get that started. Today would be a good day to understand this, that thank God He pilots us through. Friend, wouldn't you hate to know this? Wouldn't you hate to just know that you have to maneuver your life all by yourself? Wouldn't you hate to know that there is nobody there that can help you in all of your situation? Friend, can I tell you this? You need to remember this and listen to this. Because the Lord piloted them and He walked them through that dry riverbed, here's what that means. They, watch, watch, they made it to the other side. Which means this, as long, watch, as long as He is your pilot, guess what? You're going to make it to the other side. Nothing can interfere with that. For, look, look what I'm talking about. If you're here this morning and you've received Jesus Christ as Savior, the devil cannot fool. Listen, he cannot, he cannot stumble you up as far as taking your salvation from you. You are going to make it to the other side. You are going to see God in all of his splendor. You are going to get there one of these days and you and I are going to scream out at the top of our lungs, worthy is the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. And you know what? The devil hates that. Why? Is because he pilots our life. This morning, I can boldly and proudly say that because I accepted him as my Savior, he has never left me one minute. May I suggest to you, if you're here this morning and you're saved, can I tell you, he's never left you at all. But preacher, I've had all these difficulties. Listen, I didn't say that you're not going to have difficulties, but even in your difficulties, he will pilot your life. All of those difficulties are simply meaning for you to cling on Him more than you ever have. Are you still with me so far? The second positive truth I want you to see is the word protected. Is the word protected. Look at uh, Psalm 106 verse number 10. I love this verse. I love the way it is stated. Now watch this, watch this. And He, talking about the Lord, and He saved them from the hand of them that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Now listen to this. This verse, this verse says he saved and redeemed. Can I personalize that verse just for a moment? That is exactly what the Lord has done for us. He saved us. He redeemed us. Aren't you glad about that? He spared us from the greatest enemy we'll ever have in our life, and that is called the devil. Amen. The word redeemed in this verse means purchased. You know what he says? That verse, he says, he purchased, he redeemed us from the enemy. In other words, God says, I bought you when I hung on Calvary's cross and I died and I was resurrected. Therefore, you are mine. Amen. Can I tell you this morning, the devil hates for you to know that. The devil don't want you to understand that. 
He purchased you by his blood. Watchman Nee tells about a new convert who came in in very, very deep sorrow to talk with him. He says this, No matter how much I pray and no matter how hard I work, I simply cannot seem to be faithful to my God. I think I'm losing my salvation. Watchman Nee said these words, Do you see this dog over here? He is my dog. He is house trained. He never makes a mess. He is obedient and he is a delight to me. Out in the kitchen, I have a son, a baby son, who makes a mess. He throws his food around. He fouls his clothes and he is a total mess. But who is going to inherit my kingdom? Not my dog. My son is my heir. You are Jesus Christ's heir because he is, it is for you he died. We are not Christ's heirs, not through our perfection, but by means of his grace. Amen. Right. Amen. Can I tell you this morning, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Amen. The third positive truth I want you to see this morning is this. They were perceptive. They were perceptive. Look at Psalm 106, verse number 12. Then believed they his words and sang his praise. Now let that sink in just for a moment. We see this truth that is the same for you and I. Not only did the Jews recognize and witness the miracles of the Lord, the Bible says they believed his words. With all they had witnessed, they were singing the Lord's praises. You too have done that when you've gone through difficult circumstances. Now listen to me. One of the things that I enjoy, especially about Sunday nights, is this. Often we will call for a a time of testimony. And during that time of testimony, we'll just ask you to simply stand up and, 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 and tell what God has done for you. And you know what people will invariably say? They'll say something like this. I thank God for my salvation. If you don't have anything else to say about the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a good jumping off point right there, amen. Or some of you may say, preacher, I've, I've had a difficult circumstances in the last couple of months, but, but I can see how God has just kind of worked some situations out and he has, he has made this situation possible, maneuvered some things around and some people. And now I can understand maybe what I was going through and things are getting a little bit more plainer in my life. Why? Because we understand this. We have perceptive. We can understand when we were back there what God, we wouldn't understand it then, but we understand it now. We have a better perception of what was going on then. God is just leading us through. Isn't it easy to sing God's praises when we can see His hand on our lives? Some of you understand what I'm talking about. Some of you this morning, if if we had the time... You could stand up and you could utter praise to the Lord and say something like this. Preacher, this time last year, I was going through this, I was going through this, I was going through this. But because of the grace of God, man, I can stand today and I can sing His praises. Because of all that I've gone through, now I understand that He is there. He is available. And I've learned some pretty tough lessons. I learned that if I keep walking my own way and keep thinking my own thoughts and keep trying to work every situation out my way, it never gets fixed. But preacher, I've learned that somehow in the midst of my darkness, watch this, in the midst of my darkness, God shows up. In the midst of my uncertainty, There's one thing I can count on. Somebody tell me who that is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. In the midst of my polluted thinking, in the midst of that I can't do it, in the midst of world is too tough, in the midst of Christianity demands too much, here's what I found out, that God is able to get me through. Amen. Why? Finally, you had some perceptive. Finally, after this situation over here, and after walking through it, and after you coming and telling me sometime last year, preacher, it's too heavy, it's too dark, I can't do it. I'm going to tell you this morning, watch, everybody watch, everybody look up here. Here's what you've learned. You know now you can. Wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. Boy, that was a pitiful response. You know now that God is able to pull you through. And here's what you learn. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I've learned that. How do you learn that? Well, because you look back, you got a little perceptive now about this, and you've seen how God is able, and that ought to give you confidence. Watch this, Calvary. That ought to give you confidence that you can walk 
with more determined steps in your future. Because if God did it back here, He can and will do it over here. Amen. Amen. Some of you sulk and some of you pout and some of you got all kind of issues. It's because you don't see what God is doing. And this is what Israel was doing. The Bible says, as they were walking through that dry riverbed, and they look back, now watch this, they look back and God collapsed those waves and all of the Egyptians was floating and dead on the seashore. Here's what they, here's what they perceived. I think God can do this. I think God is able. Listen, whether, come on, come on. Whether you know it or not, God is still able. Right. Not to pick on nobody. But whether you believe it or not, God is still able. And whether or not you want to step inside of the program that God has for you, He is still able. Amen. They look back and the Bible says they sing His praises. Now, what kind of songs were they singing? I don't know, but I bet they were happy songs. I, I, I don't know, but I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking if you see some dead Egyptians and they're the one that was trying to get you to kill you and you see them floating on the seashore, you probably have a perception in you probably understand, hey, God is able. God did something for us. And I just believe that God is powerful enough to get us, watch this, to get us through all circumstances of my life. Wow. The Bible says they sing His Praises. If you have a pen, I'm going to ha ask you to do something very quickly with me. I want you to mark a certain word that's listed over and over. And I think this, this word is listed because I think you and I need to see it this morning. Psalm 68, 19. Psalm 68, 19. If you have a pen, underscore this. Blessed be the Lord, and boy do I love this, who daily... Circle that word, daily loadeth us with benefits. Daily. What does he do? Preacher, I don't see that God does anything for me. Well, let me give you something he's already done for you this morning. He got you up. He got you to the house of the Lord. The Bible says he loads us up daily with benefits. Praise the Lord for that. Look at Psalm 103, verse number 2. Psalm 103, verse number 2. Look what it says. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do today. And forget not all His benefits. Psalm 116, verse number 12. Again, He wants to re reiterate something that you and I should already know. What shall I render unto the Lord for all His benefits toward me? Friend, what am I saying? If he can take these rebellious Jewish nation and lead them through the Red Sea and have all the carcasses of the Egyptians on the seashore, then I'm just quite certain whatever you're facing this morning, God is able. Praise the Lord for that. I want you to see an interesting verse that, that uh, I ran across this week in in. in Studying. Look at Isaiah 58 for 14, if you would, right quick. This is kind of uh, on this same, this benefit thing I want you to see. Isaiah 58, 14, notice what it says. The Bible says, then, and I hate to break into that because you need to see what's before that, but it says, then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord the, hath spoken it. I want you to look at this interesting phrase that verse says. I will cause thee to ride upon the high places. Did you know what that verse means, that portion means? It means you can have victory. This phrase was taken when a conqueror came riding along in his chariot. This is what he's talking about. This is what Isaiah is speaking about. It's speaking about victory. And I don't know about you, but there's some in this room that needs more victories than you're experiencing right now. Here's what the verse is saying. You can ride upon the high places. You can be sure of victory if you'll follow the Word of God. Just as Kathy, that illustration we told you a while, be you doers of the Word. This verse also reminds us 
and feed them, feed thee with the heritage of Jacob. Meaning that all of God's blessings and God's covenant can be shared by you. God gives us a taste of what lies ahead and just gives us a longing to spend eternity with him. Now, everybody look up here. I know you're drifting mentally, so let me draw you in a minute. Come on. I'm convinced here on this earth, right here, not, not up there, but right here, I'm convinced there are occasions that God gives us glimpses of what we will get on the other side. I, I believe God works in such mighty ways that sometimes when God is blessing your life and when God is, is real evident in your spirit and you know that He's there, your prayer life is activated, you, you enjoy the things of God, I believe God is whispering to you and He's saying this, Hold on. Hold on. I've got something better than this. Hold on. Hold on. You know what he was saying? Look, it may be, you may be going through a good time now, but it ain't nothing compared to what's coming. He gives us just small glimpses of what you and I will taste one of these days when we're around his banquet table. Wow. Don't you think God can set a wonderful table? Now, come on, come on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't you think God can set a wonderful banquet table for you and I? You bet you he can. Friend, I want to tell you this. When we're up there and we're, we're celebrating with the Lord, we're going to look at one another and we're going to say, My, oh my, was this better than we thought it could ever be. My, oh my, look at this. Look at, Pop's going to look at his legs and he's going to say, I can do this again. I can do this again. I can do this again. Friend, listen, there is more to come than what we've got here. Amen. Hang on, brother, beloved. There is victory, but he gives us glimpses here. And he's saying, hang on, the best is yet to come. Amen. Are you following me so far? With all of that said, let me show you this, and we'll briefly tie all of this up. Not only did we see the three positive truths, let me show you the three negative truths that the, psalm, that the psalmist listed. Now watch this. Look at Psalm 106, verse 13, and I'll hurry. The Bible says they soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. The first negative truth is a word for forget or forgot. The first word is forgot. When you begin to forget what the Lord has done for you, soon your service is going to be stale. It's going to be boring. And then you're going to have an effective Christian life. You will soon look back at other things to try to entertain yourself with. The word forgot in that verse has the meaning of a short attention span. Isn't it? Watch this. Watch it. Isn't it something that today we have a short attention span when it comes to spirituality? Yeah, that's right. Here's what I know. When you're watching gun smoke, your attention span isn't short. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. Let's be honest. Well, preacher, for crying out loud, they're more entertaining than you are. I, I can't. I, 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 I can see that. I, I get that, and I, I'll agree with that. I'm not asking you to, to tap into me, but I'm asking you to tap into the resources of heavenly provisions. Here's what they says. God, we understand what you did back here. We understand that the Egyptians were dead and floating on the seashore. We understand that the waves broke upon them. But God, right now... That, watch it. That really doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Which means this. This is what the modern day Christianity is all about. We're wanting that next fad. We're wanting something to make us feel good. We're wanting something to really shoot down from the sky. God, if you could just write your will in the clouds, I can do it. But if you don't do that, then I'm just going to jump around and just kind of see where it fits me. I want to go to this brand X, and I want to try this brand X, and I want to try that TV preacher, and I'm going to try this on for size. And Because quite frankly, Lord, all of that stuff that you've done for me, just doesn't mean anything anymore. They said they forgot. Could it be possible that there is somebody in this very room this morning has forgotten what God has done for you? 
Maybe you've forgotten the healing that He's done for you through a surgery, through a cancer. Maybe you have forgotten how God in His infinite mercy pulled you and your family together when it would have been just as simple for you to say, it's no longer worth it, I'm going to go my separate way. You forgot the times that you called the preacher and he prayed with you. You forgot the time that people came down to the altar and prayed and cried over your situation. And now you're telling God, it's just not that important to me anymore. I believe that's right where we are. We forget. They soon forgot His works. you got to be t- kidding me. What do you mean? All I had to look back and see what God's done, and now I cannot even perceive, I can't even sense what God's doing in my life. Friend, I want to tell you, that's a dangerous place, my friend. That's dangerous when we start getting into that situation. There are people living miserable lives. It's simply because, watch this, they choose to. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Everybody look. They choose to. Two women who have the power of hope are by the name of Jenna De Jesus and Amanda Berry. Both were held captive for more than a decade by a man by the name of Ariel Castro. For Amanda Berry, the ordeal began on April the 21st of 2003, the day before her 17th birthday, when she accepted a ride from Castro, a schoolmate's father. Amanda Berry would be 27 years old and the mother of a six-year-old daughter by Castro when she finally broke free. Berry and De Jesus tell their story in the book Hope, a a memoir of survival in Cleveland, say that despite all of their brutal treatment, years of captivity, they never gave up hope. Even when Barry, a, Barry's child was born, she made a makeshift classroom when her chi- child turned five as a symbol of belief that one day they would lead a normal life. These young girls never surrendered their hope in the future. They held captive for over a decade and subjected to unspeakable treatment, but they continued to believe that things would work out. Amanda's advice for those who are experiencing hard times, she says this, stay strong and stay positive and never give up hope. Gina adds, knowing you're going to have some hard times, but you can get through it. Beloved, can I tell you as a pastor, I know you're going to have some hard times. I know difficulty can come right around the corner, but I'm telling you, we still have a God in heaven who loves you, who who desires for your fellowship and companionship, and I don't care what the devil says, I don't care what the skeptics say, you and I can overcome. Amen. In the midst of danger or hard times, you must not lose heart or hope because God at any moment, can set you free. Secondly, the, the second negative truth is found in uh, Psalm 106, verse number 14. It is a word forsook. It is a word forsook. Psalm 106, verse 14 says, But lusted exceedingly. The word lusted means to greatly desire or long after. Not only did they lust after other things, the Bible says they did so exceedingly. Here is what was going on. They did not enjoy what the Lord was providing, things like protection and provisions. They wanted something different, so they lusted. They were willing to give up the benefits that the Lord was providing to try something new. Maybe you didn't get that. They would give up security in the Lord for something temporal. They wanted some different food, food like quails, a little bit more spice that they left behind in Egypt. And they told the Lord simply, God, you're just too boring. God, we need something a little bit more spicy in our life. And God, if you could just spice things up, you're just, you're just not what we really need at the moment. Psalm chapter 81, verse number 10, watch what it says. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice and Israel would not have none of me. So I gave them to their own heart's lust and they walked in their own counsels. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me and Israel had walked in my ways. Now watch what he says. I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. (laughs) You know what he says? I would have done all those things for them but they wanted something different than me. Can I tell you this? 
Some of you in here are trying to dab something different than, than the Lord. Here's what you want to do. On Sundays, you want to kind of dip your foot over in Christianity, but in the real world, you want to get out here and do everything else. And you'll come on Sundays and dip and kind of taste here. But here's what you're saying. God, you're just not enough. You're just boring to me. And, and God, I need something extra in my life. No, listen to me, friend. God is not boring. God is exciting. God is all-compassing. He made this world, spoke it into existence. The only thing that's boring in your life is your relationship with Christ. No, He's not boring. My friend, I want to tell you, when we get to heaven, I believe that every second, every millisecond we'll spend in heaven will be something totally different. I believe that God is so great and so awesome that when we get to heaven, we can't even imagine the truth and the glory and the splendor that awaits us. No, my friend, God is not boring. God is not dead. God is not deaf to your cries. It's just that you're trying to have a little bit more of the world and a little less of God. And that's what the Jews were trying to do. They said, you're just boring me, God. Spice my life up. Beloved, you might want to be careful as you pray that. Because just as sure as you want that, you may regret what you ask for. The third negative truth is a word forfeited. The third negative truth is a word forfeited. Psalm chapter 106, verse number 15 says this, And He gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. What really people thought they wanted turned out to be the worst possible deal. Can I tell you this? You can be fat on the world's goods and services, but lean in your service to the Lord. And yet our barns are bursting with pleasures of years past. All those things were supposed to make you happy, you remember? But all those little toys you've got stored up in your barns and in your closets, you realize now that that wasn't happy. They didn't make you happy. And here's what you're doing. Here's what you're doing. Because that stuff wasn't designed to make you happy, you're buying more. You're buying more. Preacher, i got to have something spiced up. I can't just work and go home, work and go home. I'm not asking you to do that, but I'm asking you to do something else this morning. I'm asking you just to trust in God's provisions. Friend, can I tell you something this morning that I'm learning? That He is indeed more of a God than... Listen, He wants to be more than what you're presently experiencing. I believe that. I personally believe that. You see, we want God in a funnel. The Bible says in the psalm that... Watch this. The psalmist says, Open your mouth and I will fill it. God says, I got a great big funnel that I'm just willing to pour on you. But we just say, God... I just want just a little bit. God says, don't want a little bit. Have more of it. It's available to you. Tap into this thing called Christianity. Tap into this thing called a relationship with Christ. No, God, you're just, you're just not what I'm seeking. I can find that on a lake. I can find that on my toys. I can find that in my hobbies. You better be careful, my friend. The Bible says they got what they wanted, but they lost what they had. Wow. What did they have? They had that abiding presence of God, but they traded that for a mouthful of quail. Can I ask you this morning, what are you trading yourself for? You normally find, and this is it. Come on, Miss Janice. You normally find what you're looking for. If you're looking for a sweetness of God, and you're on that path, can I tell you, you'll find it. But if you're looking for something different than God and you're different than that relationship and you want something spicier and you're wanting something God and you just you want Him when you want Him and you don't want Him when you don't want Him, you usually find that as well. But here's the gist of the, old, the whole thing. Listen to this. Just as sure as I'm standing here this morning, God is faithful to you. Any constant is faithful to you. But here's what you're trying to do. And you're trying to substitute God's faithfulness and His provisions for something the devil is wanting to give you, something temporal and something with no hope. Now listen to me as I close. On the big, broad spectrum, somebody is here this morning. You're dipping your toes in both waters. And you're finding out that the devil is pulling you and pulling you and pulling you. And you're saying, Preacher, I don't know how to react on that. I don't know how to get past that. 
Pastor Frank, can I tell you this morning, look back on that seashore where you come from. Look back of what God's done for you in your past. He's delivered you. He's protected you. He's fed you. He's housed you. He's clothed you. Listen, I can tell you this morning, we could go on and on with the benefits of the Lord. And yet we are willing to trade that for a mouthful of quail. One more time. One more time. Somebody here in this room has just, you're vacillating back and forth. You're going this way and this way and this way, and you really hadn't made up your mind which, is, which way you're going to go. Are you ready for this? Come on, come on, come on. I'm done. Come on. Listen, watch, watch, watch. Everybody watch. There was a little boy who kept falling out of the bed. His mama would go in night after night after night and put the little boy back in bed. One night he rode out of bed and he hollered and said, Mama, I fell out of bed. Why am I always falling out of the bed? She went into his room and says, Honey, the reason you're falling out of your bed is you're too close to the edge. The reason some of you are falling and the reason why some of you are not having victory this morning is some of you are living too close to the edge. Let me remind you, scoot over. Scoot over. And don't give the devil that opportunity to push you over. My friend, let me tell you, it's not worth it. Because what you and I have one day is going to be far greater than you've experienced here. Some of you need to grasp that this morning. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Father, I pray, Lord, the very best I know. That, Lord, we saw the three positive examples and we saw the three negative examples this morning. But, Father, I don't know where people are, but they're... They're, they're either one or the other. And Lord, this morning, we need a big dose of who you are. Father, don't let our dreams die because of the devil has stolen them. Don't let our passion wane because we can't get up on Sunday morning or Sunday night. Don't let us be deceived into thinking that we're okay when our hearts is as black and as far from God as they possibly could be. Father, this morning, would you come down and just light upon our people? Would you bring us exactly what we need for this hour? We need you, Lord. We need you. No one looking around, just the preacher, so I can pray with you in my office this next week. Preacher, there's a spiritual need I have. I'm asking you to pray for me this next week in, in, in your devotions. Would you lift up your hands so I can be diligent about that? Others, 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 others. Preacher, there is a spiritual need that I have. I really need your direction. Any others? Any others? Father, you saw these hands that went up. We ask you, Lord, to pour out your mighty, 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 mighty blessings upon their lives. Show them who you are. Reveal your will for their lives. In Jesus' name, we're going to ask you to stand quietly, reverently all over the building. If the Holy Spirit so moved, would you come? Would you come and spend some time with the Lord?